I have asthma, but I can still play jump rope. I have asthma, but I still can run fast. Go! I have asthma, but I don't let it stop me. I can still have fun with my friends because I'm in charge of my asthma and I can stay healthy. I don't have to miss school, even though I have asthma. But I do have to know what makes it hard for me to breathe, what medicines to take, and when to take them. 14-year-old Ashley Wright, an 8th grader at Milwaukee's Sarah Scott School, knows those answers. She's been struggling with asthma for 12 years, but she'd also like you to know that she lives a pretty normal life. The Milwaukee Health Department has been very helpful to Ashley's family as they work to control and treat her asthma. More on that in a moment. First, a definition. Asthma is a chronic inflammatory condition, uh, primarily involving the lungs. Uh, the symptoms are coughing, particularly nighttime cough that wakens children and adults, uh, wheezing, especially with exercise and physical activity, uh, or shortness of breath. And uh, the uh, triggers of asthma um, include allergens. Some people are allergic to things like cat and dog dander, to mice and rats, to cockroaches and dust, to flowers and grass. Uh, the most common irritant and actually a cause of asthma in little kids is environmental tobacco smoke. Um, and uh, uh, asthma is a condition that can be controlled and people can be protected from exacerbations or worsening episodes of asthma if they take the right precautions. And those precautions include avoiding the environmental triggers and taking appropriate preventive medicines and finally uh, monitoring the condition with partnership with a health care provider. Avoiding asthma triggers or irritants isn't always possible in our environment. What can we do about that? You're, you're absolutely right. It is difficult to avoid some allergens and irritants. Um, if someone is exposed inadvertently, the f first thing to do is wash it off. Uh, wash one's face and hands to uh, eliminate constant exposure. Uh, the second thing to do is to perhaps take medications that reduce the allergic response. That would include antihistamines by mouth, uh, topical nasal steroid spray, sprays in the nose that reduce inflammation. Um, and there are other types of medicines that can help reduce the allergic reaction to allergens. For a parent, uh, repeated episodes of coughing, uh, persistent nighttime coughing, um, a strong family history of allergies and asthma, maybe clues, but in general, uh, when someone is suspicious that their child might have asthma, we'd encourage them to see a pediatrician or family physician for an evaluation. Okay, I just wanted to find out um, how her asthma's been doing and how, what your symptoms have been like. So, you know, we usually ask you just about the last two weeks. So. Just during the last two weeks during the daytime, have you had any coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath? None of the two weeks, so no yeah. symptoms? Good. Ashley and her mom, Sally, are part of a special asthma research and intervention program in the Milwaukee Health Department. They learned about the condition, its causes and symptoms, and the importance of taking medications, and how to reduce and eliminate allergens and irritants in the home that can trigger an attack. My job is to um, receive referrals um, for children who have uncontrolled asthma and complete an assessment on them and then um, refer them out for case management. Case management being where somebody would come out to the home and provide um, education and assessment around environmental triggers. Um, and the reason that we provide home visiting is that we find that, um, you know, the the majority of the time where people are trying to manage their asthma or self-manage their asthma is in the home. So it only makes sense for us to come out to the home um, and, and try to help them self-manage, you know, at a place where they're most comfortable and where they're doing it anyway. 
Um, so we generally come out and we'll do a home environmental assessment where we try to identify if there's any allergens in the home and then provide education and tools and support to reduce those allergens. Um, but we also provide education on medication devices, um, utilizing your medication, make sure you're compliant with your medication, um, learning about the anatomy and physiology of asthma, what asthma actually is, and what's happening to your body when you're doing it. Um, we stress um, communication with the primary care physician and having them have that constant communication um, and visits to their uh, primary care physician or specialist um, so that they can make the best decision um, for their asthma care. What does happen when someone has an asthma attack? What happens to the body? Well, what's happening is your body is reacting to something that you're allergic to um, and you have inflammation and swelling in your bronchial tubes in your lungs and you have mucus buildup. So um, normally where somebody's bronchial tubes are wide open, the air can flow through um, normally, somebody who has asthma has inflammation swelling already and then they come in contact with something that they're allergic to or they get a cold or a virus and their bronchial tube starts swelling up and they actually start constricting um, where they get real tight, almost like if you've got a Charlie horse in your leg or something like that. So, and so then you're not able to get the air flow in and out. A peak flow meter measures how well air is moving out of the lungs. This tool, medication, and the inhaler combined with the written asthma action plan allows parents and caregivers to proactively prevent and manage asthma attacks. She know how to do her medicine. She know what to look for, the sign that she'll need to be around, cigarette, dust mouth, you know how to treat them, how to do, what to do. And I can tell my boys, no smoking. I got a sign out there saying no smoking. And yeah, I think it, it, it really helped. And I think she have improved a lot. Really have. Over the year, from last year to now, yes, it really helped. It's a scary thing to have, because I have it myself, so I know what the symptom is. Mm -hmm. And it's a scary thing. It, you can't breathe, you get panic, and with her, it was just like, you can see her chest going in and out, in and out. And that's something, then they put her on the oxygen thing, and it make her just very frightened. So yes, it is, it's a scary thing to do, scary thing for the kid to go through. One of the, the things I noticed when I was doing my inspection is the, looks like there's a little bit of water damage up there. Mm -hmm. is, have you noticed water coming in through there? I noticed, well, when I noticed, it was already had come through there. Okay. So then it, it doesn't spread a little bit more. Okay. Now is it mainly when it, when it rains outside? Yeah. Okay. Because mm -hmm. that is, you know, something that we want to look at because of that water. If that water is still coming through, it can definitely damage the wood yeah. and, you know, the structure of the house and cause mold to grow in there. Right. So While a nurse helps the family with case management, an environmental health inspector does an assessment of allergens and irritants in the home. I come into the house, actually take the samples. We're testing for lead, first of all, in several different areas of the house. And we're also taking vacuum samples to try and detect different allergens that would trigger asthma. When we look around the house, we're looking for moisture-related problems. Um, we take a look at gutters to make sure water is going away from the house on the outside. Um, we'll take a look at the, the ceiling, see if there's been any water penetration in there. We don't, we're trying to keep mold from growing in the house so that it doesn't affect the asthma. Um, we'll take a look in the bathroom because that's a big area where moisture is always a problem. Under the sinks, things like that. Other things that we look for um, are main allergens that are going to trigger asthma. The main ones that we look for are cockroach, mice, dust mites, cat and dog are the, are the big ones. Um, those are, the, when I do the vacuum samples, we send those to the lab and they will actually analyze those and find out how much of each of those allergens are present so that when we get those results back, the nurse can work with the family and figure out how to reduce those, those allergens. Um, other things that we will do is if half of the families do get an intervention where we will come out and do some work. So if there's minor home repair that needs to be done in the house, we can take care of that, such as gutters. Um, if there's holes in the wall or water problems, we can take care of that. Part of our intervention is also a deep cleaning of the house because you want to get rid of all, um, all dust in the house to try and start from zero and see how quickly that dust reloads. So we'll have a contractor come in 
clean every horizontal surface in the house. They'll also shampoo all the carpeting. Uh, another thing is pest management and then the once the initial um, treatment has been done, the nurse works with the family to keep the pest from coming back after that treatment's been done. As mentioned earlier, Ashley, her family, and their home were part of a year-long Health and Homes Demonstration Research Program, one of only a few in the country. This is a randomized control trial that um, was funded by HUD in collaboration with Fight Asthma Milwaukee and the Robert Woods jo Johnson Foundation. And um, it's a strict research project. We had limited uh, recruitability, which um, caused some problems, but we were able to recruit from Downtown Health Center and four children's medical groups throughout Milwaukee. We uh, are able to recruit in the zip code area, so we have a large uh, target area. Uh, the purpose is to develop and um, study f interventions that include case management, asthma case management, and integrated pest management, uh, minor home repair, and a deep cleaning. Uh, in order to understand whether or not these are very effective, cost effective and effective to a family's asthma, we'd had to have to have a control group. So this is why it's a randomized control trial. When we first go into a property, we don't know which group the families are in, so it's a blind visit. Um, it's 150 properties, 75 will receive the interventions and 75 do not. The control, or all of the groups, so how all 150 receive bed encasings, which are effective in reducing dust mites in beds and bedding where children sleep, which seems to be a, a huge asthma problem. Uh, the integrated pest management is a, has found to be more effective than just spraying pesticides for what pesticides can bother a child's asthma. The, the integrated pest management is sealing cracks and, and crevices, stopping pests from coming in, stop, stop giving them the things they like, like the food and the harborage. And so, it's a more holistic way of reducing pests, which reduces the allergens. This is a really uh, up-and-coming project that's really ahead of its time. And um, we hope that our, our outcomes are great for the children and their asthma, and also to design a cost-effective treatment so that when we go into a property, we can say, you have pest problems, so here, we'll come in and do this, and it's $150, or it's at one cost rather than a large amount that people cannot afford. There are only a few other projects that are similar to this. Um, it is strict research, so the other projects that are looking at, that are not research, they're demonstration, so they're just testing them. But because we have a control group, we're able to say, in our intervention group, you know, so many percent at the end, which is not quite done, so many percent of the children actually had a better quality of life. It reduced their doctor visits and their emergency room visits compared to those in a control group who had, did not have them. So I agreed to it and I joined it and it really helped. Went straight through for a year. I love it. I enjoyed the people that I worked with. The one who did the cleaning, the um, people that he is here today that helped me through it. And they really did a beautiful job to my home. I'm not taking her to the hospital like I was. She breathing more better. The atmosphere in the house is more cleaner. The dust, and I don't smell that anymore. It's, it's really, it's beautiful. So I hope that it helped a lot of kids that the same way it helped Ashley. Even my other boys, they have asthma too. And I think it's beautiful. And I, can, I learn a lot from them. Ten years ago, Fight Asthma Milwaukee Allies was created to help control asthma among Milwaukee children. Working under the leadership of the Children's Hospital and Health System, it provides an integrated system of health care professionals, families, community, and government representatives. Dr. John Moyer is director of the Fight Asthma Milwaukee Coalition. He says there is some evidence that the collaboration is making a difference in the quality of life for children in Milwaukee. Fight as Milwaukee has a care coordination case management committee that involves multiple members. The City of Milwaukee Health Department serves as the care coordinating headquarters to accept referrals and then uh, decide what kind of management, including home-based visiting, might be appropriate for a particular family. Uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin, Aurora Visiting Nurses Association, and Covenant Home Health provide nurses who fortunately in our community are funded by Medicaid as well as private insurers to provide home asthma education. 
We also have clinics like the Downtown Health Center and Children's Medical Group that have referred patients for studies of this nursing intervention and home environmental cleanup to try to understand what works best to develop best practices in our own community to continually try to improve the quality of services delivered to needy families. There's no cure for asthma. However, um, limiting exposure to triggers, for example, specifically avoiding environmental tobacco smoke in infancy and toddlerhood may actually pre prevent uh, asthma from being a worse condition. But there is no cure. There's a lot of research going on now to understand why asthma develops, why there's an increased prevalence over the past 15, 20 years, and to ultimately try to find a cure. And yet, while the numbers may be up, apparently hospitalizations are down. Yeah, we're quite uh, fortunate in the Milwaukee County area. Hospitalizations for childhood asthma are down more than 60% in the past decade. We also are quite proud that among children who are enrolled in the Medicaid program, we're in the top 10% nationally for uh, prescriptions of controller or preventive medicines to those children. At the same time, we have work to do. 40% of uh, children are, with asthma are exposed to tobacco smoke in their home, and we still have uh, asthma as one of the most common reasons for emergency department visits. While prevalence is increased, we'd like to believe in the Milwaukee area that hospitalizations are down dramatically because of the concerted efforts of our community. While the Health Department, the Fight Asthma Milwaukee Coalition, and its allies are helping provide a better quality of life for many children, there is still a lot to be done for what remains a serious problem in our community. Among children, uh, about 10 to 15 percent have asthma, and that's based on surveillance work we've done in the Milwaukee Public Schools, uh, Aurora Wick site, and the Downtown Health Center. So that means that there's about 30,000 children with asthma in Milwaukee County. Um, about one out of three young children will have an emergency department visit for asthma. Um, and asthma is the number one reason for hospitalization at Children's Hospital. So it, it is a very common condition and the key point for listeners is to uh, take measures that can control this common chronic condition. Many people with sensitive lungs also have sensitive noses and eyes, allergic rhinitis, and have sensitive skin, eczema. So it's quite common for us to see a baby who's born to a parent who has asthma, runs in the family, that baby develops eczema early in life, goes on to have bronchiolitis, a respiratory infection with wheezing, and uh, eventually at a, two, three years of age may develop allergic rhinitis, all symptoms uh, and signs that are associated with asthma. While asthma is a chronic condition and there is no cure, people can live a normal life. Absolutely. Um, Amon Green, a Green Bay football packer, um, Jerome Bettis, a football player at Pittsburgh Steelers, um, Jackie Joyner Kersey are a few examples of fabulous athletes who perform incredibly well despite having asthma. And they've all learned that if they take the appropriate medications on a regular basis, avoid triggers, and seek medical attention uh, on a preventive basis that they can perform optimally. The same is true for folks who aren't Olympic athletes um, and star football players. They can lead fairly normal lives if they uh, attend to the, the risk factors and try hard to control this condition. And that's the best news to Ashley and Sally and others in the Wright family and community who have this chronic condition. Street-level scaffolding has been in place underneath the City Hall bell tower for three years to protect against falling debris. Now Market Street is closed through traffic, and scaffolding is going up all around the building. It's far from being the only activity, but the scaffolding project itself is expected to take several months. City Hall has taken on significance beyond the bricks and mortar that hold it together, said Mayor Tom Barrett. He added the restoration has been one of his most challenging decisions and one that has cultural, economic, and financial implications for the city. There's no project that has more significance to the city of Milwaukee than the restoration of City Hall. Uh, city Hall, of course, is the symbol of our city. And its 100-year history, which is rich with tradition, uh, is something that has to be preserved. 
when this building was built over 100 years ago, it was actually the third tallest structure in the United States, um, behind only the Washington Monument and Philadelphia City Hall. So it's important for us to retain the history, the architectural significance, and really the symbolism that this building brings to our entire city. So we are committed to doing what we need to do to restore this building. Uh, ironically, at the end of the day, and this is the good news and the bad news, we, we will spend a lot of money, it's not going to look measurably different from what it looks like right now. Um, but what we're doing is we're trying to preserve this building. Uh, some have talked about tearing down City Hall. Um, I'm not going to let that happen. Um, some people have talked about just doing nothing, which I think would end up in having City Hall crumble. Uh, we have had problems with, with actual mortar falling out of the, the tower in particular. Um, and that's a safety concern for the citizens of Milwaukee. So what we want to do is we want to restore uh, the tower in particular to its original elegance, um, to its original pr purpose. Uh, and we think that by doing that, we're going to have a city hall that every citizen in the city of Milwaukee can be proud of for decades to come. You should be aware that a visit to city hall for the next three years will by necessity be a bit more complicated. Because of site constraints, the general contractor needs to occupy the southern third of Market Street between City Hall and the other two city buildings in the complex for construction and storage related activities. Closed on July 28th, it's expected the street closure will last till December of 2008. In addition, a number of parking spaces have been removed. Common Council President Willie Hines says he believes the council vote to support the project indicates aldermen appreciate what City Hall means to Milwaukee, but they will be closely monitoring the project. Well, first of all, it's a very great complex. Um, it's historic, it's on the registry as I understand it, and it's clearly give us an opportunity to preserve and maintain the building um, and so that future generations are able to appreciate their architectural features and the beauty of what City Hall has to offer. And so it was an easy, it was easy for the council to make that decision. Obviously, um, the financing um, was not only concerns that we had, but it was clearly concerns that our citizens and residents had as well. You know, it's a significant dollar amount, um, but what we did was we did not allow it to go on the tax rolls, which is what a number of people had concerns about. And neither is it something that will impact the city's debt, per se, but more importantly, the redevelopment authority stepped forward, issued the bonds, we'll clearly have to pay them back, but the bonds won't go against the city's, the city's rating, it clearly will go on the redevelopment rating, but more importantly, we do have the resources, we've protected the taxpayers, and we now will have a city hall that would be restored to its historic significance. Again, this restoration is going to take about three years. Keep that in mind if you have any business to conduct at City Hall. We will have scaffolding, various street closes for their own protection, for their safety, to ensure that the no hurt or danger or harm come against the citizens. And while we can still keep the building open, functioning, having the various departments yet remain there, I think only one, the city attorneys, will be removed, more importantly, um, the scaffolding that is being constructed, um, the trailers that is being put down, is really there so the work can begin and so that we can still do our daily um, services in City Hall, but nevertheless recognizing that it will be a, an inconvenience. Parking around the building has been removed, and so when residents need to give themselves adequate time. Um, they need to probably contact us through through email or telephone and have us come out to you if we can as well. And that would way um, government can truly be in the neighborhoods and the community and interactive with you in your neighborhood and not necessarily at City Hall. The Department of Public Works has produced a video reviewing the history and significance of City Hall and showing close up the corrosion, cracking and other problems associated with the building that is now showing its age. It's an icon, a symbol of traditional values and sound government. Milwaukee City Hall is a spectacular landmark. It's an integral part of the city's rich past and its promising future. Milwaukee City Hall was completed in 1896. It was lauded as an innovative and technologically advanced building. The city grew up and spread out around this great structure. Today, City Hall is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. 
It may be Milwaukee's most significant building, and now it's time to repair and restore City Hall. The building has been thoroughly inspected, studied, and analyzed. The extensive examination took three years. This hands-on inspection was a three-step process. Experienced engineers, architects, and inspectors repelled the building, and they examined the structure. These people specialize in historic restorations. The initial investigation produced a document entitled the Wiss Janney Elsner Report. Based upon the report's recommendations, the City Council approved the City Hall restoration project. The first step was to select a design team. There was a prodigious group of bidders. The local firm, Engberg Anderson Design Partnership, which teamed with nationally known restoration experts Simpson, Gumperts, and Hager, was selected. This team will determine the scope of work, provide contract documents, and will oversee the restoration process. This video summarizes the restoration work that's necessary to preserve the architectural character and the structural integrity of this historic masterpiece. City Hall's exterior walls are masonry. They're the building's primary load-bearing structural elements. The walls have a brick core with reddish brick on the exterior. The examination shows the building's core is in good condition. But City Hall's exterior needs significant repairs. Most of the problems are attributed to years of exposure to the elements. The original roof on the tower was slate. It was replaced with a copper roof in 1923. And now that 80-year-old roof must be replaced. The copper has tears, gaps, failed patches, and punctures. The copper roof leaks, and that's causing problems inside the spire. The moisture is corroding steel and it saturates the clay tile subsurface. Of course, that moisture freezes, then thaws, and decades of freeze-thaw cycles have broken down the tiles, and they must be replaced. A rigid steel frame supporting the tower starts at the ninth floor. Exposed beams are painted and well-maintained. Some are slightly corroded, but most of the steel is in good condition. The spire has four clock gables, they all need extensive repairs. Here's why. There are steel columns and beams embedded in the gables. That steel is corroded. The corrosion causes cracking on the gable's exterior and interior walls. All of the cracked gables are out of vertical plumb. They're leaning out toward the street. The gable's upper portions must be disassembled and rebuilt. For the most part, the terracotta on the clock gable's exteriors is in good shape but the mortar joints between the terracotta units are in poor condition, and so are the support walls behind the gables. The mortar joints and cracks are allowing water into the walls. In the 1970s, some terracotta was mended with epoxy, but those repairs failed. Some of the gable ends are cracked and displaced. This one was pinned to keep it in place. Recently, additional netting was installed to support it. These areas need to be rebuilt. The original clocks had translucent faces. They were replaced with steel faces in 1932. Now these clocks need extensive repair. They're corroded, and the panels must be replaced. They will be replaced with historically correct translucent panels. The support structure needs work as well. There are terracotta rings around the clocks. That terracotta must be replaced and the masonry adjacent to the clocks needs to be rebuilt. Some of City Hall's greatest architectural features are located between the 12th and 13th levels. These beautiful colonnades, pinnacles, and turrets anchor each corner of the tower. Each support column is a true masonry form, so there isn't any supporting steel. These structures need repair. The face brick has large vertical cracks, and a lot of mortar is gone or loose. There's plenty of water damage here. Mortar joints are in poor condition. That means water is seeping into the masonry core. When that moisture evaporates, it leaves behind mineral deposits on the surface. The four turrets are in bad condition too. The mortar is fractured and it lacks adhesion. This netting was installed to snag falling pieces. 
the turrets and the colonnades must be completely rebuilt. The belfry on the 12th level is open on all four sides, so the masonry here takes a pounding from the elements. These mortar joints have deteriorated faster than joints in other areas. There's a lot of failed mortar, displacement and cracking on the brick banding of the entablature. This banding area must be rebuilt. The columns that support the banding must be rebuilt as well. The lower masonry walls are massive, and they must be stabilized. The platforms at the bell level and observation deck comprise the structural floor systems. They need attention too. The roof coating has reached its service life. It's leaking, and the structural flooring system has localized water damage. This roof floor system must be replaced. Immediately above the observation deck level are the acanthus leaf frieze and the strap work frieze. Both banding areas have a lot of terracotta that needs repair. There are cracks, small bisque and glaze spalls, and failed mortar joints. There have been attempts to repair this terracotta with limited success. They've produced unsightly epoxy smears. Some areas have been ground and patched with colored mortar. And in other places, like on this railing, the terracotta was removed and replaced with concrete. Now a safety net covers the railing. For the most part, the repairs haven't worked very well. The repelling team collected enough information so terracotta manufacturers can estimate the cost to restore these bandings. Another dominant architectural feature of the tower is the Grand Arcade. These three sculpted masonry arches, columns, and piers support the upper 25% of the masonry walls of the tower. These arches are cracked on the interior and the exterior. Monitoring and structural analysis of the tower have determined the cracks are caused by thermal movements of the tower and by the massive weight above. It's believed these cracks developed early in the structure's life. Stainless steel tie rods will be inserted in the masonry to strengthen these arches. The lower two-thirds of the tower has some terracotta soffits and banding that need repair. These areas are at the same level as the main cornice in the main building. There are some fractures in the terracotta soffits on the ninth floor. They're caused by embedded metal rods that are corroded. The same thing has happened on the seventh floor of the tower. Here, the soffits have been stabilized with temporary wood bracing. There are wide vertical cracks at the obtuse corners of the tower. These cracks are similar to the ones in the piers and columns on the twelfth floor of the tower. The slate roof is 30 years old. It should be good for another 20 years, but it does need some maintenance now. Broken or missing slates should be replaced with new matching slate units. And between the eighth floor dormers, new ice and water shield materials should be installed with flashing and gutters. Those eighth floor dormers are out of plumb. Corroded steel has lifted up the masonry, and that's created a gap. The dormers must be rebuilt. A new gutter was installed under the old counter flashing during the 1970s restoration. The flashing detail has failed, and water has penetrated the masonry walls. For years, water has infiltrated the core masonry walls below the gutter line. This has caused problems inside and out. Trapped moisture is moving to the inside of the building. It's ruining plaster walls in City Hall offices. Back outside, the brick is distressed. There's staining and spalling of the brick band below the seventh floor main cornice. Here, the mortar joints and the brick masonry need to be rebuilt. The terracotta on the north elevation needs attention. The terracotta around windows is cracking, and so are the narrow terracotta mullions. All of the window frames in City Hall are originals. They're more than 100 years old. The wooden sash is problematic. It leaks. Some of the wood is bad, and so is most of the glazing. More than 350 windows in City Hall failed water tests. City Hall's windows will be replaced. The first two stories of City Hall are sandstone. It needs some maintenance work too. The sandstone is eroded by water. This is evident under the continuous third floor sill, at the egg and dart moldings below the second floor sills, and at the arm trim on the ground floor. The molding under the third floor sill is also severely eroded. Water is also penetrating the sandstone. That loosens and delaminates layers of the sandstone. 
After City Hall's facade is restored, work will focus on the building's foundation. Some areas of the foundation have compressed and settled. These exterior cracks were caused by settling. And inside City Hall, there are cracks in the walls of council chambers. They're also caused by the foundation compressing and settling. The design team carefully probed, removed, load tested, and analyzed the foundation. These wood timber pilings will need repair. This work and the replacement of the hollow sidewalks surrounding City Hall will be done as part of the hollow walk replacement program. When it was near completion, the Wiss Janney Elsner report underwent a thorough peer review. An independent team of preservation experts, architects, structural and technical experts from across the country examined the report. The peer review team indicates Milwaukee City Hall is among a select group of buildings that qualifies for National Historic Landmark status. The reviewers also recommend this unique piece of architecture be restored to the fullest extent possible. If the work isn't done, City Hall will continue to deteriorate while repair costs will escalate. In the early 1890s, many Milwaukeeans balked at the idea of a new city hall. There was controversy over the design and the $1 million price tag. But in the summer of 1891, the Common Council authorized construction. When it was completed, the new city hall became popular immediately. It still is today. City Hall has stood the test of time and experts agree it's a sound masonry and steel structure. In the past 15 years, costly repairs have been made to City Hall. However, the last major repairs to the masonry were completed in 1974. For it to remain sound, City Hall's exterior requires preventative restoration work. Most of the repairs will be done to the grand 393-foot tall tower. Investments in similar projects are being made around the country. Architectural treasures built around the turn of the 19th century are being restored and preserved. This landmark is Milwaukee's architectural centerpiece.